Clinical depression is defined as a mental health disorder characterized by persistently depressed mood or loss of interest in activities, causing significant impairment in daily life. Possible causes include a combination of biological, psychological, and social sources of distress. Increasingly, research suggests these factors may cause changes in brain function, including altered activity of certain neural circuits in the brain. The persistent feeling of sadness or loss of interest that characterizes major depression can lead to a range of behavioral and physical symptoms. These may include changes in sleep, appetite, energy level, concentration, daily behavior, or self-esteem. Depression can also be associated with thoughts of suicide. The mainstay of treatment is usually medication, talk therapy, or a combination of the two. Increasingly, research suggests these treatments may normalize brain changes associated with depression. If you are struggling with depression, please see a physician immediately. Call them right now. Tell them, I'm depressed and I need help. If you can't do that, ask a family member to help you. If you can't do that, go to Google and type in, I am depressed. If you are having suicidal thoughts, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The number is 1-800-273-8255. And then you'll get to speak with a counselor that will help you. The National Suicide Prevention, again, is at 1-800-273-8255. Crisistextline.org describes self-harm as follows. For some people, when depression and anxiety lead to a tornado of emotions, they turn to self-harm looking for a release. Self-harm and self-injury are any forms of hurting oneself on purpose. Usually, when people self-harm, they do not do so as a suicide attempt. Rather, they self-harm as a way to release painful emotions. CrisisTextLine.org has more information. Or you can contact them right now by texting HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741-741. That will connect you with a crisis counselor. Text HOME to 741-741. In the United States and Canada. In the United Kingdom, text 85258. And in Ireland, 86 one eight zero zero two eight zero. Welcome to the Juice Box Podcast. This is episode three thirty six, another in my After Dark series. Today's episode is called After Dark: Depression and Self Harm. When I originally decided to make these After Dark episodes. I tried to think about the topics that no one discusses around type 1 diabetes. And I tell you, I had no idea where this was going to go. But back at episode 274, this all began with a drinking addition. And then at episode 283, talked about smoking weed with type 1 diabetes. At episode 305, we discussed trauma and addiction. Episode 319 was a frank discussion from a female perspective about having sex with type 1 diabetes. And today's show is with an anonymous 24-year-old type 1 female who's going to discuss her depression and self-harm. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan. You can, of course, do whatever you want, but I wouldn't suggest this episode for children. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Dexcom, Omnipod, the Contour Next One blood glucose meter, and Touched by Type 1. You can go to touchedbytype1.org, contournext1.com, myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox, or dexcom.com forward slash juicebox to learn more about the good people who support this podcast. Today's episode does not lend itself to breaking in the middle for an advertisement, but the ads will be at the end. If you're interested in a tubeless insulin pump, an amazing continuous glucose monitor, 
a blood sugar meter that I find to be second to none. We're a wonderful organization helping people with type 1 diabetes. There'll be more information about them at the end of the show. And I'm going to start off by telling everybody that we're not using your name. So at no point during this conversation am I going to refer to you by your name. Um, okay. And everyone will figure out why as we're talking. Okay? Okay. That seems fair. Now, I do want to know some stuff about you to get some background. So, for instance, how old are you? I am 24. 24. And how old were you when you were diagnosed with type 1? 12. 12 years old. All right. Hold on one second. Why are people messaging me while I'm trying to do this? Hold on one second. No problem. I'm just going to turn this off. All right. So you've had diabetes for the same amount of time uh, that you were alive before you had diabetes. You're at your midway point. Yes. And I thought about that. Um, cause it was June of when I got diagnosed and I just started bawling because I don't like, it's hard for me to remember before I was diagnosed. Interesting. Even though it was 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that's a, not as a strange thing as you probably think. I don't have a ton of like really strong young people. Memories. To be perfectly honest, I don't have a lot of really strong 20 year old memories, 30 year old memories, or 40 year old memories. I remember, you know, today and a couple of weeks ago, maybe. <laughs> but, but I think p- some people remember things differently. Or do you think that there's a reason that that's the case? Um, well, I think I'm really good at shutting things out that I don't want to remember because I remember things about like my kindergarten experience and things like all through elementary school. Okay. So you remember the stuff that's pleasant to remember? Yeah. Okay. So let's have to go into this slowly. So a lot of people will email me and ask me questions about diabetes and things like that. Every once in a while, someone says something to me that I'm thinking, oh, wow, I might not be the right person to ask this question to, but you asked it to me. So, okay. And one, one that comes to mind is, you know, somebody who messaged me and said, I love the podcast. My children passed away in a car accident, but I still listen to the podcast to remember my one son. And that's an email for me that I'm just like, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, but I've learned in the past that just sort of being honest is the best and, you know, saying whatever it is that occurs to say, um, and then giving the person the option to talk more if they want to. And yeah sort of how you and I met um, very recently. So how long ago did, were we messaging? Only about a week? Yeah, a week and a half maybe. Do you, do you remember what made you send the message initially? I think just because um, it was that like very first initial Zoom conference thing. Okay, so we all got together and talked over Zoom because like, – yeah, okay. So many people might not know, but there were 70 of you who got together yeah. and we just sort of hung out and chatted for an hour and a half and people held up their like graphs and we talked about how to, you know, how to bolus differently and, and, you know. So I wasn't part of that one. Oh, you were the one where I was, oh, no kidding. So you were in the initial one where I jumped on and said, hey, let's do a Facebook live. I want to try to find a way for us all to talk better. I wish we could all talk. And someone said Zoom. And I started going, yeah, I've been thinking about that, but I don't know what to do. And then I just sort of just threw together a Zoom account right then and there. And we all jumped over to it. That's the one you were in? Yes. Ah, okay. What did we talk about in that one? Mm, I think you were like just randomly choosing, like looking at people and unmuting them and talking to them. Oh, was that fun? It was. It was. I just felt not completely alone. Gotcha. Okay. Did you speak during that? I did. You did. Okay. Do you remember what we talked about? Well, because when you were doing your Facebook live, you were like, how's everybody doing? And I was like, how's everybody doing with the like COVID-19? And I said, oh, I'm like super worried. And I remember you go, why are you worried? And I, I'm a student teacher and just like, 
the fact that some of my kids don't necessarily get meals when they're not at school. And so you were just like kind of having me elaborate more. Gotcha. And so we're going to be honest with each other here today. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so first of all, you just used your name, but I'll bleep it out. Don't worry about that. Um, okay. And if it happens again, I'll, I'll bleep it out. It's fine. Okay. Don't, don't, I don't want you thinking about that. <laughs> so I, from my perspective, when I hear someone, especially a younger person, first say, you know, I'm worried about my kids. I'm a teacher. I thought, oh, that's nice. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's lovely. And then you expounded a little more. And as you were talking, I thought that you are more closely tied to this feeling than felt healthy to me. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's what I kind of intuitively felt from you while you were talking. I thought, ooh, she's being impacted by this more than, like, if, if, if my kids felt the way you felt, I would feel like I needed to intervene somehow or help them. Um, but I didn't as much as I just was like, oh, tell me about it a little bit. But then you yeah. sent a note afterwards. And in that note, I, I don't know how much of the note you want to share, I guess. Um, well, I guess I'll start out. Um, I started cutting myself as a freshman in high school. Okay. And I've battled with depression for years now Mm -hmm. being able to really like mask it and have this shell that I'm quote normal like mentally normal um has been really hard for me and oh go ahead no no I'm so sorry I was reaching for something um so I cut myself all through high school all four years um, probably three months into it, me cutting every single day, my mom found out and I told her I'd stop and I just moved the placement. Okay. You just moved it to somewhere she couldn't see as easily. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to have to ask a couple of questions because I don't understand. Uh, no problem. I'll, I'll, don't, don't please. So first of all, when you talk about depression, can you put words to what it feels like to be depressed? <laughs> um, I think now my depression is a lot different than what it was in high school. Okay. Um, in high school, I felt, <sighs> I guess I just felt like there was no point. There was no reason to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. There, like, the only reason I went to school, talked to my siblings, talked to my mom, and played sports was to try to feel something. Okay. And I think the cutting just went hand in hand because I was in control of it and I could determine how deep it went and how much I wanted to feel. Even though after a week, the feeling went away, like the pain went away. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, all the things that most of us think about as, you know, average life, going to school, having relationships with people, playing a sport as a child, you didn't get any feedback from those things at all. Is that right? Like, like any, like emotional feedback from it? Mm, On the inside? No, but on the outside, I mean, I would laugh and smile and have emotion. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't completely emotionless, but I mean, nothing so, so there's like the, the impact of it, the idea of like euphoria or just, you know, anything that kind of lights you up inside for a second, you just don't feel that way. So when you hear people say, I feel dead inside or empty or all the different ways I've heard it explained, it's like there's just a void and nothing fills it or nothing turns it on. At, at that point, cutting is helped, the only like thing. cutting is what my whole life evolved around right and that's what like 
made me feel something inside. Right. So if so, you couldn't, you weren't getting feelings from the what they quote unquote normal avenues. So you went to something like obvious, like your body can't ignore that you're in pain. So mm-hmm. and so, is that feeling like like? W- do you know what it is you're trying to accomplish by putting yourself in pain? No. No. Um, I think it was just something I could control. Okay. And you felt it for real. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that, does that lead to, like, I'm thinking it's not a, it's not a feeling you want. Like, I guess in the absence of any feeling, some feeling is positive but also it was painful to you. So was that a double-edged sword too? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then um, my junior year of Mm -hmm. high school, I started dating this kid, well, guy. um, And he was a freshman. And we were three years age difference. We're now engaged Hopefully, we're going to get married this summer. Fingers crossed. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you mean fingers crossed, like if they let us all outside again to do something. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Gotcha. Um, But I was very open and upfront and honest with him about my cutting. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, like, he doesn't know what to do with it. Right. Because, I mean, he's a freshman in high school doesn't like this is his first exposure to it yeah and that scared me and so i began to bottle it up again i went the whole trying to see somebody a doctor and that did not turn out well and so i felt like there was no way of getting how i felt out are you comfortable with telling me why the experience with the doctor didn't go well? Yeah. Um, so I'm from a very rural town. Okay. There's there's one stoplight in the whole county, and the county is the fifth largest county in the state. I'll tell you that would depress me. Just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if, if you're if you're not an outdoorsy person, you kind of screwed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, really, there was really, like, only one doctor you could see. Mm -hmm. And even when I got diagnosed, I had to travel three hours away because that was the nearest endocrinologist. Okay. But I'll talk. So, when I first went and saw the doctor, um, I was beginning to open up and find ways to cope that were better Mm -hmm. and then right after the um meeting with him because it would just be him and i after the meeting my mom would be like what did you guys talk about what's going on and scare me because she's not the best person that handles delicate things and also if i can you know assume for a minute she's probably super worried that whatever troubles you're having are her fault. Oh and, yeah. And she either doesn't want that to be true or doesn't or knows it's true and doesn't want anybody to say it to anybody else. It's you know, there's her humanity is uh is in on is playing defense at that moment. It was this doctor, oh, yeah. by the way, a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, do you know? I think he was a children's psychiatrist. Okay. Specifically. Mm-hmm. Um And so I probably saw him for two months, uh, multiple times a week. And then all of a sudden, I learned that he committed suicide. Yeah, that just sounds like the end of a bad joke, doesn't it? Um, (laughs) And and so I'm trying to figure out, how old were you at this point? Oh, boy. Um, Probably almost 16. Okay. Now, let me ask you, when he commits suicide after talking to you for two months, what's the feeling or what's the interpretation from you? Do you feel at fault 
are you just like, I can't believe I was finally getting help and now that person's gone? Like, what was that experience? I felt that my only outlet was gone. Yeah. Um, I knew it wasn't my fault. Good. And I now, like, looking back on this whole experience, I realized, like, wow, that is something that I was right about. <laughs> Um, well, you know what you're really proving is that living in a place that rural with one stoplight is not just depressing to one person. It's apparently depressing to a lot of people. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm certain we don't know his, his – oh, is it a, a male or a female doctor? I'm sorry. A male. A male. We don't know his, his issues, but, you know, you know, he was obviously having trouble no differently than a lot of other people. Um, exactly. You know, and – but the biggest concern is is that you had found a place – to learn coping skills, but they weren't ingrained in you yet, I'm assuming. And then your sounding board was gone and your teacher was gone. And then there was just no one else to go to. Is that right? Exactly. So then I just sunk back in to what I knew what to do and what I, at this point, quote unquote, enjoyed doing. What, what were some of the changes that you were seeing while you were speaking with the, the psychiatrist? Like what was, what what were some of the improvements you were getting? I remember my mom making a comment like one Sunday morning at breakfast. Um, sh- she said, you have a twinkle in your eye. And I was like, wow. I went like, is she just trying to tell me what I want to hear? Or do I have like light again yeah and that was really hard to accept because i had felt this way for so long and then i realized like this is what she wants to see from me this is how i can be normal again okay and so i was able to just take that time stamp of how I looked, how I felt, in, well, not necessarily inside, mm-hmm. but on the outside. And that was what I looked like at all times. Now, did you feel like that or were you pretending? Oh, I was pretending. Yeah. And so, so this is really interesting for people who don't have these feelings. You were probably progressing and you saw a little bit of like, you know, you might not have even have noticed it at that point. You know, sort of like the beginning of a diet when you're three pounds down, you don't really know it, but you're, so you're on your way to something, but you're not even aware of it. Somebody else looks at you and goes, oh, wow, you look good. And that reminds you, I'm heavy. And I, and here's what I don't like about myself. And here's all the things that are wrong. Like, and so this very kind, you know, statement from your mother, which is, hey, you have a, you have a, a sparkle in your eye. It sends you down a rabbit hole of her concerns and feelings. Like you don't think about yourself in that moment. Like I think a a person who's not struggling might think, Oh wow, I'm working on myself and I'm making an improvement and other people can see it. That's fantastic. I'll keep going. But you transferred yourself right into her head and said, she's sad that I'm not happy. She wants me to look like this. This is what I should be doing. This is what normal looks like. And instead of continuing that thought with, so I'll continue to do what I'm doing because it's working. You thought, I'll, this is where I'll put myself. I'll, this is the picture I'm going to paint on my face because it makes my mom happy and probably makes other people happy and it makes me look quote unquote normal. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Wow. That's f- up. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, <laughs> seriously. I, I am sorry that you feel that way. Um, any tragedies in your life as a young person? Any any um I, I um I, were you abused at all like is there anything that we can point to or is that you have family history of depression is there anything you can look back to and say this is where this came from i don't think so um i mean before i was 10 my well when i was 3 my parents divorced my dad is on his third wife and my mom married and divorced before I was 10 so or so okay. and so I've been I've been through three divorces as a kid and um 
with my father's current wife, he has clearly chosen her. And that has been a struggle. Um, but that was also, well, I started cutting before because I lived with them for a shorter period of time. Okay. And so does it make this seeing your dad happy instead of making you feel like you're happy for your dad, make you feel like he wasn't happy with me or my mom, but he's happy with this person. Does it always shift back to you like that? No, no, I, cause she was, she was always very nice to my brother and I, mm-hmm. um, and then I just, I moved in with them on my birthday. I don't remember which one, but one of my uncles got me this like really cool, um, like Swiss army knife and none of them knew that I was going through this whole phase and then I remember, like, just getting the urge to cut myself. And I remember going into my room, closing the door, getting out this brand new Swiss Army knife, opening it, and just slashing my thigh. Wow. And then I realized it's not stopping. And so I just grabbed a t-shirt and like tied it around my leg and went to sleep because I felt better, but I was worried like, oh my gosh. Now you're worried and about then, the wound. You feel better. Yeah. You feel better from cutting, but now you're worried about the actual wound. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so the next morning I wake up and it's still bleeding. How deep do you and, think it was? Um, I didn't see bone. But I tr- like this is one thing that I haven't thought about in years because it's painful sure. at times to think about. Um, but I don't really know. I it was, but it was a bad enough wound that overnight it didn't it didn't heal over or or clot. Yeah. What do you do then? Because it can't be mistaken for something else, right? You you can't say I walked past the table. It's it's worse no. than that, right? Like at that point, I took off that like blood soaked t shirt and just went and told my dad like I have a problem. Well, and then how did he handle that? I mean, beyond the wound, I'm assuming you got that dressed and taken care of. But did he try? Like what? I guess my question is, is what's that reaction like from a person who I'm assuming up until that moment had never thought about something like that in their life. And then all of a sudden, you know, his daughter standing there saying, Hey, I cut myself to feel something. And I don't know that I would know what to say is, is what I'm getting at. What did he say? Nothing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) can you understand that? Like from an, an academic point of view? Now I can. Right. Um, but not at the time. No. no. I wouldn't imagine. You're a kid. You're looking for your parents to have the answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but after, like we sat down and talked, and he instantly took it as like my hobbies were causing me to do this. Ah. So he, he whatever he could see, he thought was... Do you, do you listen to the podcast a lot? I it's hard for me to get through a lot of episodes because I just, well, I commute uh, to college right. and it's a 30 minute commute and I can't get all the way through. Well, that and I just like 10 minutes into it, whatever where you guys are talking about, I just ball and so, cry. So no matter what someone's talking about you take on their pain for the most part, like your first two episodes Mm -hmm. that you put out were the hardest for me because I was being really honest about how I felt about raising Arden. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it took me 
two weeks to get through like those two episodes. Why did you keep trying? Because I think it's interesting to hear a point of view of somebody that doesn't have diabetes, but wants what's best for their child. Okay. Like my parents wanted for me, but, and this isn't really like diabetes related, but they want what's best for me. Right. So it's nice to know that there are other people in the world who are trying to do their best for other people and for their kids. Yeah. But the content is really hard for you to absorb. So yes. you're, you're getting some good from it and some and bad. So, so like, try to, like, listen, I record all these podcasts, and I know they're emotional, and I'm an emotional person. And so when I'm hearing them, you know, I'm doing my best to shut them off, um, but feel them enough that I can have the conversation. For instance, if you and I were just talking on the phone, I'd probably be crying by now talking to you about the things you're saying. But I'm trying to be um, academic and thoughtful and listen to you and tell you how it makes me feel, um, hoping that you're going to find your way to some sort of a thought. Like we're, we're recording right now because your note made me respond to you and say, you should really, you know, I, I can't tell you what to do, but I think you should find help, uh, in the form of, you know, a doctor. And you said, yeah, I tried that. And my doctor killed himself. And then I was like, I looked at my wife. I'm like, what am I going to do? I was like, I can't just tell this poor girl, oh, sorry, goodbye. And so I said, well, maybe if we talked a little bit, we could find our way through to some sort of an answer for you. Um, maybe just saying it to somebody else who's, you know, you know, there but not there. You can't see me, right? You're not reading my face. You don't know if I'm upset for you while you're talking. Um, maybe that'll help. And, you know, we're going to try it here and do it. And at the very least you're going to help a lot of other people. And so you get to have that feeling, you know, when, when this is over, there are a lot of people who feel like you who are hiding it just the way you were hiding it. And they're going to know they're not alone. And I imagine that's going to be helpful for them. So I appreciate you doing this. I hope it helps you. I definitely expect it to help somebody else. All I can do right now is just sit and cry because for the most part, I haven't thought about these thoughts for a long time. And so it's just kind of opening old wounds up. Of course. But, but you, when you say you haven't thought about them, you mean you don't give voice to them, but they still impact your day. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I, well, I think about cutting myself at least half a dozen times a day. Is there anything else that you found so far that can take the place of that need? <sighs> I cry and I sleep. Oh, I have to tell I, you, I like doing both of those things. I really do. I love a good cry, but not the way you're describing. And sleeping is terrific, and I definitely don't do enough of it. So you're either letting it out or shutting it off by being asleep. Yes. Gotcha. And I just, well, growing up, I, w I was never the kid that took a 10-minute nap. I took a three-hour nap. Mm-hmm. And so now that I'm a quote adult and I can decide when I want to take a nap, I usually like in a 24 hour period, I will sleep for 20 hours. Wow. And that includes like two naps and sleeping for eight to 10 hours. And then in the four hours you're awake, you're crying. Usually I'm, well, I'm working on schoolwork usually. Mm -hmm. So it at least takes my mind off of it. So when you're busy, it's better? For the most part. Um, now that I have chosen a field that I'm dealing with children, because mm -hmm. um, I'm student teaching in a kindergarten classroom. So I hang out with five-year-olds all day. Yeah, And I know that none of them some of them do have like like not the best lives, but they are not at developmentally where I started cutting myself, which thank goodness. But it just 
takes a toll on like my empathy has grown so much okay that it is so hard for me to come home on a bad day and not like act on my urges gotcha it is I'm trying to understand the idea of choosing to be around small children. Is it is is there comfort in their innocence? Is there comfort in the fact that they haven't had problems yet? And so when you see them have that problem of not eat, having a meal, now you realize that they're they might have problems too. I'm trying to figure out why you were drawn to this line of work. In the beginning, um, like when I could decide if I wanted to teach primary or secondary I chose primary because I'm taller than kindergartners but I'm a short person and I didn't want to deal with high schoolers because I thought I'd have to be a bitch so you thought oh so you thought if you were physically smaller than someone you'd have to assert yourself in a different way and do you think did you not are are you a bitch and you didn't want to be one or you, or that's a side, like what, you know I, what I mean? I thought, I still think this, that high schoolers know better and kindergarten, well, like little primary kids, for little people, they're so innocent and they're, they don't understand. Mm. And I have a lot more patience for a five-year-old than a 16-year-old because kindergartners, they don't know how to do school. And so it's a learning curve for everyone. Yeah. Have you ever thought about your location being part of this? I this I might be 100% off on this, but I think of this sometimes. Um, in Ireland, the potato famine was so terrible for so long that it it created a lot of um, depression, alcoholism, schizophrenia, mental illness, like all kinds of stuff in the Irish population that some people believe still sticks to them to this day. And, and, and you really, you live nowhere. Like as you're talking, I think you should save up a couple of thousand dollars, get on an airplane, fly to some great Island and get a job carrying drinks to people on the beach and just, you know, go somewhere interesting and, and relaxing and do something that doesn't require you to be around people long enough to start taking on their pain. Um, because I mean, you're doing that and listen, I, I'm nowhere near where you are, but I am at my core you know, I am a person who's a caregiver at heart, I think. I'm happiest when the people around me are taken care of. I don't like to see people upset, and I will put a lot of myself into helping them feel better. It's probably why I understand Arden's diabetes so well, and just other people, you know, they can be big problems or little problems. The people I love, I want to be, I want for them to be okay. But, you know, if you dig into that a little bit, I'm adopted, so I've been abandoned once. I don't think of it as abandonment, but it's true, right? Like, there were people who had me who were just like, Scott, nah, somebody else can take care of him. And then I find out later that that is not what my birth mother wanted. She was forced by her family to give me away. And that gave me some comfort, but, you know, it doesn't fix whatever happens to you that you're not aware of. And then my adopted parents... um split up when I'm 13 on my birthday, by the way. Wow. So, and you were shipped from one house to another on your birthday. So there's little things about that that are hard to ignore, even so, you know, subconsciously, you know, my father went to work on my birthday, took me with him in the morning, dropped me at my grandmother's house. I had a lovely day. He picked me up uh, in the afternoon, said, what do you want for your birthday? I, I wanted this uh, cartridge and floppy disk that went into your Commodore 64 that made your Commodore uh, able to copy a floppy disk. These are probably a lot of words you don't know. Okay. And I and my friends had a mass, um, uh, mafia like, um, setup where we were copying video games on, on 
flop, by the way, when I say floppy disk, I mean the big ones that were five and a quarter inches square. Like, do you, <laughs> do you even know the ones I mean? Yes. Okay. So you'd put this cartridge in the side of your Commodore 64. It had a, like a, a literally a toggle switch on it. Then you'd put this floppy disk in, run this program. At a certain point, you had to yank the floppy disk out, flip the switch on the cartridge, stuff in the game, let it run, pop it out, stuff in a blank one, and it would actually make a copy of the disk. And I wanted that. <laughs> so I asked for it. It was $100. $100 in 1983 for my dad that worked in a rubber molding plant and my mom who didn't have a job and we were broke. $100 was all the money in the world. And my dad just goes, yeah, sure. Where do we get it? And we drove home, stopped at this like CD computer store, um, bought this thing. He bought it for me. Big smile on his face. He was as happy as he could be to give me this thing. I had never actually seen him that happy before in my life. We got home. We had dinner that I got to choose. My dad got up, took a shower, came back downstairs, said he was going out, and never came home on my 13th birthday. And I got to tell you, hard not to feel like that's kind of your fault when you're 13. You know what I mean? Now, when I look back on it now, I see it differently. My dad was cheating on my mom for a long time. He obviously wasn't happy. He didn't like being broke. He had more responsibility than he knew what to do with. And for a split second, buying me something that wasn't going to hurt him because he knew he was probably going to file for bankruptcy after he got divorced. He was like, oh, this is what it feels like to give my son something he wants. This is nice. He was so happy. This had nothing to do with me. But for a long time, it felt like I was the reason they got divorced. I didn't know any of the other myriad of like, you know, reasons behind any of it. Um, and as an adult now, I know it's not my fault and I don't have any like lingering impact from it as I talk to you today, but there's no doubt in my mind that I try really hard to keep my family together because I know what it feels like when it falls apart. Right. So I have this extra empathy that I have for their problems because when they're upset, I, I know there's a path out of being upset and I have also seen people give up before they get to the end of the path. So I just take on the bullshit that comes with it and disperse it so that they have time to get through it. So that whatever they're feeling in that moment doesn't bounce around inside of my home the way I saw it bounce around inside of my parents' home. Like, had my parents just gone to neutral corners, do you know what I mean? Or relaxed a little bit or had better communication skills or whatever it ended up being that they needed they could possibly have worked out their, their issues. And so I think a lot of people can work out their issues if they have enough time and don't blow things up in the middle of the argument. And so, yeah. and so that's ends up being who I am. And I yeah. don't know if the people around me know that about me. I don't know if they appreciate it or would want it not to be the case. I have no idea, but I just know that that's how I feel. I feel like we're a good group. The four of us, we love each other and something that's bullshit should not derail us. So I think we should have every option and opportunity to not let that happen. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, if I came home tomorrow and I found out my wife had been cheating on me for 30 years, I'd be like, oh, you know what? This didn't work out. Everybody out. You, you know what I mean? Like, but, but, but I'm saying for the little day-to-day -day things. Um, and so I know what it feels like to look at somebody, see them sad, and then feel sad. But I probably have... 3% of what you have. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So listen, I, go ahead. Say, say what you're going to say. Oh, just you telling your story reminds me, because even though I was three, I remember like my dad leaving. And it's the most vivid memory that I have. Yeah. I used to go downstairs in the middle of the night and I found in the back of a coat closet our family portrait, which was probably in a frame that was maybe, I don't know, a couple feet wide and three feet tall. You know, used to have to go out and have a picture taken and it was mounted and all this stuff. And my mom didn't get rid of it. She put it all the way back of this long, narrow closet like you'd never. And I found it one day and I used to come down in the middle of the night. First, I would go into the bathroom on the second floor 
and look out the back of the house where the driveway was. And I would sit there and every time car lights would come up, I would allow myself to be excited that my dad was coming home until the car passed by my house. So, so probably not for nothing, not exactly the same, but that's cutting a little bit. You know what I mean? Like I'm opening, like I'm opening myself up to this excitement that I know intellectually is not real, but it felt so good for 20 seconds while the car drove by to think my dad was coming home. Yeah. Right. And then I would get horribly upset and then go downstairs, dig the picture out, sit on the sofa, hold the picture, cry, get tired, put the picture away and go to sleep. Yeah. That sound familiar with different words? For the most part, yes. Yeah. So I think we need to find a way to get you from all of this to some of it. Because those feelings that I describe in small doses are a really valuable part of being alive. You know, like that empathy. I love that you're empathetic. I think that's terrific. Um, You know, but how do you get from there to there? Is it a rewiring of your brain chemistry that's going to help? Is it changing locations? Like, are there people you need to get away from? Is there a place you need to get away from? Like, I don't know what the answer is, but you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and hiding it. Cause at some point that's going to, it's going to short circuit you. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well, and cause I lived in rural for 18 years Mm -hmm. and then I moved six hours away to the state capital and just like, it's a culture shock. Holy moly. (laughs) Going from like 2000 people in a town or less to your state capital and then trying to figure it all out Mm -hmm. and finally finding a place like student teaching, being with the same 25 kids and having great support in that sense has been very positive and negative with me. How's it been negative? I, my mom works in the school district where I grew up and she was the librarian at the middle school when I passed out and got diagnosed. Um, so she was with me from day one Mm -hmm. in the school system. And I knew just from knowing some of my peers that kids didn't have, some kids didn't have the best home life, but now being an adult and being a co-teacher in a classroom, um, you can really say it. Yes, yeah. and seeing, making those hard calls to the parents and making, like, having a little kid come up and say that, like, they slept in the car all night. Right. And then, uh, but they don't tell me that, even because I'm a mandatory reporter, they don't tell me that, they tell the aide, so it's not up to me. Like, I, with mandatory reporting, it's who the the first person that the child says it to. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of questions. So first I want to ask you a little bit about, does all of this impact your type one diabetes care? I think the mental part of it does because I usually go days without eating or like in high school, when I was at the height of it, Mm -hmm. I would just, cause I had, um, for the first from 12 to 16, I had a pump with tubing. I can't remember. And then I've been on the Omnipod ever since. Okay. And at the height of my cutting, I would just like slap on the Omnipod with no insulin in it. And I would just go, like, I 
would just have a shell of like, yeah, I have my insulin on, my my pot is on, so I must be taking insulin. So I would calm my mom down because on top of it all, you know, me having these struggling issues mentally, I'm also diabetic. It's not something you can't yeah, take ignore. lightly. Yeah, right. And so um, I did a lot of things that I look back now and I'm like, I hope to live like till I'm 70 because I really f- my body up. Okay. Well, how are you doing now though? Are you, are you in a better space with it? Yes. Um, I've been, I still have my Omnipod and I actually give like have insulin in it. Um, I've been on the Dexcom since August. Cool. Is it helping? And yeah, pretty all through high school and into, well, up until last year, last August, my A1C was over 11. Wow. Like consistently between 11 and 13. Mm -hmm. And I haven't, I think the last time I went to my endocrinologist was in January or February and I was down to 7.8. Hey, good for you. That's really cool. And so I feel like I can, I mean, it's a big step, but now that I'm going to get married and like we've talked about like wanting kids someday. Now I feel like I can't think about me anymore since I'm the one that has the child. And it's like, now I'm like, well, 7.8, I can't do anything with 7.8. So I feel like it's just like me being at 12 again. Well, it's not. It's a, it's an amazing leap. It's this, it, that's the sparkle in your eye that somebody notices. It's not, it's not a reason to, um, to go backwards. It's a reason to be hopeful and keep moving forward. Also, it's interesting where you place your hope and where you don't place your hope. You want to be 70, you want to have kids and those things seem reasonable to you. You don't, you, you don't imagine yourself 70 cutting yourself, do you? No. And you don't imagine yourself with children and being, um, in the situation you're currently in or, or worse as it's been in the past. So you are hopeful. So there's a feeling you have that you're in complete control of that's working for you the way it's supposed to. Yeah. And I think that's really, um, you know, encouraging. Uh, you got your A1C down significantly. You're paying, you know, obviously much better attention. Are you eating more now that your blood sugars are better? Were you not eating because you were trying to keep your blood sugars lower? Mm. Well, pre-COVID-19 quarantining myself-esque, I, well, I've never been a breakfast eater. I don't, well, I take thyroid medication and other medications in the morning, Mm -hmm. and that's pretty much my breakfast. Synthroid is your breakfast? Yep. I don't think that has any nutritional value. Um, <laughs> no. So I, I hear what you're saying. So it throws off your timing because you're supposed to take that medicine on an empty stomach. It's supposed to be in there for like a half an hour or something like that before you eat. And that throws off your morning. Yeah. And take it before bed. You can do that. I, yes. I've just never ate like even... When I was younger, I don't remember eating breakfast. Yeah, you don't have to apologize to me. I'm not a big breakfast eater at all. Like when I'm trying to to eat more, I kind of force myself to have an egg in the morning or something like that. But I don't wake up and think to eat right away. Yeah, and I'm an extremely picky eater. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard for me to find breakfast type food that I will eat. Which ones do you do you like? Well, I'm a big potato person, Mm -hmm. and I've pretty much stopped eating potatoes because it's just – it's not too hard for me with my diabetes, but to me, it's just not worth it. Um, But I don't eat eggs. I don't – like, there's 
the list that I don't eat or I don't like outweighs what I do like. Gotcha. Well, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with sticking to a simple diet. I, there are a lot of people who do that, but find the one thing or the three things you do really like and, you know, have them around the house. See if that helps you eat breakfast. Like imagine if yeah. you just move your Synthroid to the night and get up in the morning and there were always three things in your refrigerator that you liked for breakfast. Like, I wonder if that wouldn't yeah. make a positive step for you. Yeah. And we've, um, since moving to the Valley, um, there's so many more you pick berry farms. Mm -hmm. And so we spend pretty much all summer picking gallons of different berries. And so now that we don't, I don't really go outside. Well, I don't go public places. We've been doing a lot more smoothies and that has been something that I have really started putting into my diet, which yeah. has helped. I feel like that has helped me. Let me ask you a question. Do you have the empathy you have for those kids? Do you have it for yourself? <sighs> my initial re response is no. Yeah. Um, I get that. I, I think that, um, it, does worrying about yourself seem selfish? Yeah, and I feel that in high school, I was consumed with myself. That, like, when I needed to do things, when I needed to act on my urges. Right. And so since then, I... I don't really like stop and reflect on my happiness or my feelings as much as I probably should. So if I asked you how you like, if you, if, if, if you allow yourself to go into your hope for a second, how, how do you think you would, would like your day to go? Like what, what, what would you want your life to be like? If I gave you a magic wand that I was like, just turn yourself into exactly the picture of what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Like, what do your days look like? Me being a stay-at-home mom and not having to worry about, like, this whole getting an education and getting a job and being able to, like, love my kids and – or my future kids and – so why are I'm you doing not, why are you doing the things that you don't want to do? Expectations? Because it's not financially it won't work financially. Okay. Well, but you've got this guy, right? And he loves you. He's thinking about marrying you. You guys are thinking about getting married, right? So I mean, would there be anything wrong with him working and you at home in a small place and you had, I don't know, a pet instead of a person? Or do you know what I mean? Like, why, why I'm, I'm being serious for a second. Like, why, why are we all trying to put ourselves into the mold that we think is right? Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with you being the, you know, it, the wife of your husband who, you know, takes care of their house. People did it for generations and decades, you know, and, and it's also cool if you don't want to be that, but it doesn't sound like that's what you want. I don't think you want a job. I definitely think that being around people who your empathy is so strong for that it's, it's causing you trouble is, um, it's problematic for you at the very least. I don't know why. I don't think it's wrong to put yourself in a situation that's good for you is what I'm saying. Does that make yeah. sense? But yeah, and I do think that my bad days are really bad. Mm -hmm. But I mean, three out of the five days of the week, I come home and I'm like, oh my gosh, guess what one of my kids did today? And I'm so excited. Like, I feel Good. like deep down, like, you won't believe the shit that happened in my classroom today. So how come when I gave you the magic wand, you didn't want that to be your life where you just feel good every day doing what you like doing? 
does it seem scarier that it might not happen? I just, I don't know. Yeah. No, I don't imagine you do. Um, so I, I, I have questions about, um, what you've tried to help this. So you tried the psych, the psychiatric route and it does sound like you're in a different location now. Like maybe a psychiatrist would be a good thing for you to do again. And you might have better access now, but aside from that, I mean, have you ever been on medication you ever smoke weed? Like, is there anything you do to alter yourself to try to make this different? And have you had any success with it? I, tr- well, since moving away, I haven't tried any antidepressants or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've tried like drinking till I'm numb or just drinking to the point of passing out. And I don't really like myself. Really, I don't like the hangover. And I, I would like to say that I want for you not to do that, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I, I think that's, I get that you tried it. It's not a viable long-term solution. So, no. so, and it did the, any of the, me- and I'm not saying the medications are either. Did you, but did you have any benefit from them or not particularly? Not that I remember. Okay. Um, I've tried like edibles Mm -hmm. and those just make me cry. Like I don't get the munchies or anything. You don't get the fun stuff that people talk about? (laughs) No, I just get like so emotional that I could do that. I can cry when I'm completely sober and clean. Yeah. Is it a sad emotion or is it just like... Do you cry over, like, would you look at a wooden tabletop and think about the dead tree? Like, is it that ridiculous or like, it, I, or does it take you into your thoughts? It, my thoughts, okay. especially. All right. So no, let's put a line through that. That's a no. All right. <laughs> um, and the medication you didn't listen. If I'm, if, if, if you put me in the situation where I'm your father for a second, I, and I've listened to this last hour talking to you, and we're not done talking yet, but I would say you have to find a competent, skilled, licensed, well-reviewed and thought of um, psychiatrist, uh, an accredited psychiatrist, not a psychologist, not a therapist. You need to go talk to a psychiatrist who can really diagnose what you know these things you're saying and make sense of them. Because if you think you're going to wall off this part of you forever, that seems highly unlikely to me. And I think you deserve whatever it is you want. You know, being 70, uh, having a great A1C, having a baby, if that's the way you want to go, being married, not being, whatever it is you want, you deserve that. And I think that you should find the best option out there to try to get to that. You know what I mean? Cause I just don't think that I don't think hiding it's going to work and, and yeah. you're, you're just to, and try to, you know, I don't even want to say try to imagine, but if you had a baby and the cutting kept going, the guilt you'd feel would be immense because you're going to, you're going to, you're going to feel this, this connection to this baby and this desire to do good things for it and to point it in the right direction. And you're going to feel like you're not doing that for it. And then that's going to be a huge problem. So you don't want to do things that are going to create new problems. You want to do things that are going to alleviate existing issues. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? And I know you know that. And that's also the strange thing about depression or these feelings you're having. It's You're not unaware. Like, right, you don't have that knife in your hand going, this is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> birthday cake time. Like, you're not thinking that. You're thinking, this is my last best option. This is... Cutting is jumping out of the window of the World Trade Center, right? Like, I'm going to jump so I don't burn to death to buy myself five more seconds. Like, it's not, yeah, right. Um, Do you have any luck looking at the world or yourself or anything in more of a macro way? Because everything you're talking about occurs to me, and I've been thinking a lot about macro and micro thinking lately, so this is maybe why my mind's going there, but... Everything you're talking about is very micro. Like you are right down on top of every little thing, seeing the the granular issue. Like these kids, 
um, you know, there's a kid who sleeps in his car. Well, if you pull yourself back a hundred miles, you know, the world's full of people who don't have a home to live in Mm -hmm. and it's incredibly terrible and horribly unfair, but in reality, and I don't mean to sound harsh, it doesn't have any real today impact on you, right? Like I I can see if you want to help that child or do something to curb, you know, homelessness, that's all really cool to work on a macro or a world level, but you can't feel it on a micro level. Like that's just not sustainable. And so, you know, sometimes I get notes from people who are like, I don't know how you talk to, I, I got a note from somebody who was like, I can't believe you talked to Donnie about his problems like that. And you weren't all broken up the whole time. I was all broken up the whole time. It, a lot of the things Donnie was saying was horrible. You don't even know what I'm saying right now. And trust me, don't listen to Donnie's episode. It'll kill you. <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> but you know, but like when I was talking to him, I had to pull myself back. I couldn't be in the, in the granules with him. I had to be back looking at him through binoculars. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just, you're so into everything like on, on that level it's hitting you too hard. You just don't have enough of a force field. And I don't know that I don't know how to create that force field. I don't even want to sit here and guess about it. And I don't even know that we should be talking about it. Like it's a force field. I mean, distance, like enough distance where you can make the statement, you know, there are children starving in, you know, X, Y, Z place. I know that's bad. I wish that wasn't that way, but in reality, I have no, sway over that. I can't really affect that. I could send a couple dollars to an organization that's trying to help. You know, I can, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do that are big picture things. But I mean, mm-hmm. but if I get into a plane to fly to, you know, the middle of some country where everybody's starving, thinking I'm going to hand them out food, that's not going to work. I'm just going to be in no time flat. I'll be in their hell too. And now I can't help them anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm involved in it. Like the people who help are a little distance. And I wonder if there's not a way to apply that idea to your everyday life, to the things you say. And I don't know, but I think there's probably somebody who could help you figure it out. I'm probably not that person. Um, but I think there probably is somebody and, and by, I mean, you sent the note to me. So, at some point in that day, you felt enough of a connection with me that you were like, maybe this person can help me, right? Because that's the only reason you would send an email like that. Don't you yeah. think? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So here we are doing it. Now we got to do the next part, which is, you know, find somebody way smarter than me who understands this a lot better than I do and get you involved with them. Because do you feel any better now than you did when we started talking? The tears have steadily rolled down my face, yeah. but yes. Good. See? Short answer. Yeah. Yes. Great. So that's really cool. So, you know, you need another person to talk to that you can have these conversations with over and over and over again, even if it's just a pressure release. And maybe, maybe for years, it'll be that for you. Maybe you'll just go a couple of times a week and talk to somebody and let off enough that, you know, you can keep moving until the next time you get to let off a little more and then find some, you know, plateau at some point, ascend and, and, and keep yourself in a situation where as you make small improvements, you can hold on to them, right? I want to see you get a twinkle in your eye and stay at that level and then get a brighter twinkle and then stay at that level and get a brighter one and a brighter one and a brighter one, not get a brighter one, feel the pressure and then backslide because that's, you're just caught in this like slippery slope. And then once you realize that's your loop, you're shutting down and pretending it doesn't exist. And that's not fair to you. You know what I mean? Like you should get to make those improvements and keep moving and forward. And I don't think that that's not possible. You're a bright person. You're thoughtful. You understand what's happening to yourself. Um, you know, maybe you can get past that and, you know, maybe there is depression that you need to, um, you know, address with something. I mean, obviously, listen, I don't want to bullshit you. 
something's wrong. You, you know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not, you're not in the same situation that the person next to you is in, but that doesn't make your situation not controllable. You know what I mean? Like, like there's, it's probably the wrong word, but I think that there's, you're not a lost cause. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I feel that like this whole COVID-19 thing has just like amplified it because I don't like we go outside, we have a bocce ball court and basketball and things to do outside. But I choose not to like, it's easier for me to stay inside and dwell and and what could happen just yeah well just like like not removing myself from the whole situation let me tell you how i think about this this specific idea and we're going to add a date to this which i don't usually do but it's april 1st 2020 just because we're talking about the coronavirus so that people can keep up all right (laughs) so listen to what i'm going to tell you here and I'm trusting you because I think you are uh, I think you are you're a smart person and I think you're gonna understand what I'm saying. This is going to be okay. And if it's not, it'll just kill us all. So one way or the other, you know, it's all right. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying yeah. by that? Like like th- this is a this is a virus. These things have happened over time and space multiple 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 times you know you can point to the spanish flu or any other number of things that have happened over history there are going to be a certain amount of people who get sick and then get better there are going to be a certain amount of people who get sick and they're going to die if you want to sequester yourself so that you're not a person who gets sick while hospitals are overtaxed i don't think that's an unreasonable thing at all and you should absolutely do that but in a month or two this is going to be passed and you still might get the coronavirus, you know, six months from now, or maybe, you know, I'm hearing J and J might have a, um, a, a, a inoculation brewing. Maybe you, you know, because of your diabetes, you'll be at the top of the list to get an inoculated. And maybe it'll never happen, but you're not afraid to die of the flu, right? Have you ever? No. Had, no, of course not. You don't think the common cold is going to be the thing that knocks you over and, and doesn't let you get back up again. The problem with this virus isn't that it exists. It's that we don't have any natural immunity to it and that it's overwhelming the healthcare system. It's not the, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, that's your concern. And so, sorry, people are texting me. Don't text me while I'm doing this. And so, <laughs> So that's the real concern. So when you look at that realistically, you're either going to get it now, later, or never. It's very likely not going to hurt you significantly. You're a young person, right? And this one doesn't seem to be getting young people. There have been, you know, there have been outbreaks throughout history that have targeted population centers you'd never believe. Like, I don't know what one of the flus, you know, hundreds of years ago mainly killed young men who were really healthy. Like, who knows why that happened? I don't know why, you know, but the truth is, is the world kept spinning. We're all still here. And the ones that are behind are, you know, going to move on. You have to think of it that way. In my opinion, my opinion is it's just no different than riding in a car or walking downstairs. People die in all kinds of weird ways every single day. There are people who are going to die reaching into a soda machine. I know that sounds ridiculous, (laughs) but it happens. They get their hands stuck and then they panic and the damn machine falls on them and kills them. It only happens to one person a year, but still, five minutes before it happens, that guy wasn't like, you know what's going to take me out? Probably a falling soda machine, you know? And so, and so in the, in the, in the short term, dude, stay inside. If that makes you comfortable, do it. You know what I mean? But you got to understand it's going to end. And I got to be honest with you. I'm lucky. First of all, I can do my business from my home. My wife can work from home. I've got my children with me. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm in that position. I don't have an essential job that I, ha- although by the way, podcasting has been deemed an essential job. <laughs> I don't know if you Good. know that because of like, I guess because of media, but anyway, I don't have an essential job. I'm not going out and collecting someone's garbage or making sure you have food or anything like that, you know? So I'm lucky, but I'm kind of treating this like a vacation. 
you know, they used to call this a staycation. It, like, there's no expectations, right? You don't have like, there's, you know, all the doors aren't being knocked on. You know, every mortgage company in the world's not going to take somebody's house. Like, this is a pause. Like, it's not set up like that yet, but it is. The world is paused. Like, can enjoy it. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what I mean? Like, just be like, woo, this is nice. There's not a lot to do. I just cleaned my bathroom. What a beautiful deep clean I just put on that bathroom. Because I was like, I'm not even in a rush. If I don't do the other bathroom today, whatever. I got nothing but time. And so, you know, in this time, what are you going to do with this time? Boy, I think you could be finding a really competent clinical psychologist, a psychiatrist that could yeah. that could maybe start talking to you on the phone or by Zoom or I don't know how they're going to do it. You could be a different person by the time, you know, coronavirus is over. Make <laughs> make another ascension. You know what I mean? Like get a little brighter sparkle for yourself. Does yeah. any of that seem reasonable or am I full of shit? I feel that like yeah it sounds great but then my like underlying thoughts creep in and i'm like i have trust issues with like i'm not saying you're gonna go and kill yourself now that you've talked to me right but it scares the shit out of me like i people commit suicide all the time for whatever reason yeah but that like I had seen him that day. Okay. And it was just like this out of nowhere thing that happened. And so I just have like this very underlying trust issue. All right. So listen, I promise you, first of all, I'm not going to kill myself. Okay. <laughs> there are plenty of people listening to me right now who are like, that guy's a narcissist because that's what they think. <laughs> and they're going to be like, he never could hurt himself. Well, A, you're right. I could never hurt myself. B, I don't believe I'm a narcissist. But that's exactly the kind of thing a narcissist would say. Um, <laughs> talking about narcissism is so funny. Uh, but let me say this to you. Until you can find a person, right, that you feel good with, I could absolutely commit to talking to you on the phone privately every week. I could be your friend through this. and Or it could be someone else. It doesn't need to be me. Okay. But I, I would 100% do that. You're lovely, and I'd like to get to know you better. And if, if, we, if we could have a conversation that would continue to get, to, your, to get you to a point where you'd be comfortable enough to reach out into the world and look for a competent person to help you, because let's be clear, I am not a competent person that should be helping you with this. Okay, But, but if, if, if you need to see me not dead for a month or a couple of you know, months or whatever, if that's what makes you comfortable, I'd be thrilled to be a little part of why your eye gets to sparkle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You let me know. I'm down with that. But if it's the voices coming in and telling you it's all going to go wrong, blah, blah, blah. To me, not knowing much about anything, that seems like, that seems like something <laughs> chemical that's, you know what I mean, happening. Because I think I'm right about this. Like you're, There's depression where the chemicals in your brain are just mixed misbalanced and and giving you know having letting you have these feelings or thoughts and then there'd be actual insanity and you're not insane <laughs> right do you know that about yourself i feel like i'm not insane <laughs> good well listen you know what insane people don't do they don't admit. consider they don't consider their sanity no they they couldn't admit it there's no way they could even consider it the listen, crazy don't know they're crazy. You understand what I'm saying? And so you're yeah. aware that this is weird, which means you're not crazy. You're not insane. All right. So you're probably depressed. Um, you haven't said anything like bipolarish. Um, you know, you're not, you don't seem manic to me unless you're not. Uh, do you get manic at all? No. Yeah. All right. You're probably just depressed. So is like a bazillion other people. And if I'm telling you, you put me in place. It, with one stop sign, I'd have grown up depressed too. And my parents get divorced, and then my, I get the diabetes. How much of this do you, do you think the diabetes pushed you? Like, did you feel any depression from that? You haven't mentioned it once as being part of this. Um, I was well for the longest time. I was just in denial about my diabetes. Yeah. Um. Probably for. 
eight or ten years. Yeah, that's a long time. And plus, then your <laughs> your blood sugar is all out of whack, which does not help how you feel, how you think. Seriously, no. Yeah, high blood pressures are tough on you. Look, I got something here. Um, National Institute of Mental Health estimates that 16.2 million U.S. adults had at least one major depressive episode in 2016. This represents 6.7% of the U.S. adult population. This is four years ago. Depression is most common in ages 18 to 25. Listen, you're 24. You're almost out of it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Yeah, right? I just got to make it to 25. But, but you know, how much of getting through stuff like this is setting short-term goals, right? Like, like I just got to make it to Tuesday. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have a conversation with somebody because that's really what psychiatry is, right? It's somebody who has a conversation with you on a regular schedule who, if they're a psychiatrist, understands the, the reason why what you're saying is happening. Like, you know that when you're talking, you don't understand why it's happening to you. But a really good psychiatrist, they know right away when you're talking. Like, they can – I am not that person. But they can they can pick through it in two seconds. They, they, you'll say something or relate a story, and they'll know this applies to, you know, this theory about mental health. And then they'll know how to direct you into a better place. You yeah. Know, you know? I just – wait. I don't know. Like, it's up to you, obviously. But let's be honest. We can't put you in charge of this decision. <laughs> you'll get depressed <laughs> in the middle of having a thought and you'll stop doing it. So you have to listen to me and go, go find that person. And until then it can be me. We can chat whenever you want. It doesn't have to okay. be recorded. I don't want it to be. We'll just talk privately. Okay. And my empathy will be all sorts of happy about that. <laughs> right. And let me tell you something else too. I really do want you to think more about having a pulled back like view of things. I don't want you to like get so far away from things. You don't feel them at all. I'm not saying that, but you need to feel far enough away to realize that that kid that can't find a place to sleep. That's not your fault. You don't have, you don't hold sway over that. It's not your responsibility. It's sad, but you have to be sad about it intellectually. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sad about hunger intellectually, about homelessness, about the border problems. Like, that stuff is, to me, it's real. It needs impacting. I help with things like that when I'm able to, but I also recognize my limitations in a global problem. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's not your fault. I mean, let's go over things. Your parents' divorce isn't your fault. Your diabetes isn't your fault. That kid not being a, having a place to sleep isn't your fault. When you listen to this podcast, other people's problems are not yours. They're not your fault. You didn't do it. Everyone's got problems. You know, if we felt bad for everybody, we'd be, you know, we'd all be in one level of swimming in a puddle of our own tears or another. You, you know, like it's just not reasonable now if that's happening to you for a chemical reason then that you got to find a way to change that like anything you can do to change that and not drinking by the way that's not what we're talking about right <laughs> if it's conversations with people um if it maybe it'll end up being medication i have no idea but yeah. you know it, it you that's not none of us could handle that so i that's what i'm trying to say to you is that if you gave me your feelings i'd be in your exact situation do you know what I mean? Like if if you, if you gave me your feelings or gave them to anybody, we'd all be right where you are. So yeah, yeah. So it's like it it would be like blaming a person with a broken leg for not being able to run a race, right? You're you're struggling with the things you're struggling with because you know there's a part of you that's not doing what it's supposed to do, or it sounds like it's doing it too much. To be perfectly honest, like you're getting way more than you need of like concern for other people and. And the idea of like drilling down on problems and thinking about things like I've never once I've, I've spoken to my mom a million times in my life and not once in one of those conversations have I ever thought like, oh, here are her, her needs in this. I'm going to blow up my life because of it. Like I see my mom's needs, but I see it at a, at a what I would consider to be a healthy level. And there are struggles my mom has in her life that I can't help her with. 
and they don't make me feel bad about myself. Yeah. yeah and oh, oh, hold on can one you second. hear me? I know you're there. Okay. Presley? Yes. Don't go anywhere. I know why I can't hear you. I just I'm having trouble getting it back. Okay. Give me one second and I'm gonna call okay. you. I'm gonna hang up and call you right back. It was for an art education class and we created like we painted individual feathers and created that wings. That's really pretty. I'm sorry, we're recording again. We had just a, a, a small <laughs> glitch for a second. But I was talking to um the person you're hearing about something in their uh in their profile picture. It's really pretty. No. People will never get to know what it is. That's their problem. Okay, so it was a weird place for there to be a technical problem, but I need to know I you know, I'd like to know where you're at before we say goodbye. So what do you think you're like what do you think because I think if you go start thinking about it, your 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 unpleasant thoughts are going to overwhelm the clarity you have right now. Is that right? Yeah, I'm extremely anxious right now. Okay. Because of the <laughs> idea of doing something? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So listen, do whatever Even if it's talking to you. Again. Like, you know, I'm not going to force you to do anything. You can do absolutely whatever you want. No one's going to make you do anything. So yeah. I'm just telling you it's an option. And if you want to take that option, it's there. And I, I'm happy to help you. And any way I can. And if you don't want that option, then it, that's cool too. You know, I just okay. think, I think it's important to know that there's probably a, a good path out there for you. And, you know, I think you need somebody to help you find it because I, I, you're having trouble finding it on your own. That's all. Okay. Anything you want to say or are you good? I am okay. Good for you. <laughs> This boy you're talking about, he do you guys live together? Yes. How much of what you just told me does he know? He, everything but how I, I feel currently. So and he, like all the thoughts probably in the last year. So does he think you're in a good place right now that you're not in? Um, I think he knows I'm not where I should be, right? but not how deep it goes. Gotcha. Do you think he could be the person you talk to? No. <laughs> is it, you don't want to, is that a part of you you don't want him to see because of your, your relationship? He is completely opposite of me in the sense that. I am very outgoing and opinionated and I wear my heart on my sleeve and I like with him, he knows my feelings every moment of the day and I can, he's completely opposite. He won't talk about his feelings to me or if I open up, he just kind of like gives me a hug because he doesn't know what to do. Yeah, well, your situation's unique. It, it's hard to know what to do. Um, that's for certain. But I don't think that you need somebody to do something. I think you need to keep talking it through. I think that's sort of like the the key is for you to continue to like let the pressure out. Do you know what I mean? Like like so that you you don't turn into a you know a steam pot that just pops its lid. You got to just keep letting it out. And if it's not him, like, I don't know, like, you know, if this is the odd, um, psychological, um, parallel to not wanting to poop with the door open in front of your, you know, your boyfriend. Um, and, and there's just some stuff about yourself that it would be hard to share. And I would get that. I would hundred percent understand that, but that then again, makes it even more important for you to, you know, to find another person to talk to because, Right now, what you're describing is you're just, you know, you're standing on thin ice and it's going to get warm at some point. So, you know, you can't 
you're not going to be able to keep the ball up in the air of pretending you're okay and painting a picture for him that he wants this that you think he wants to see which by the way i don't know that he wants to see that picture like maybe he really wants to know what's happening to you and you know that's up to you about whether or not you can show it to him but maybe if you spoke to someone else you could get to a point where you would be able to share it to him like how cool would it be to come to him and say hey listen i had trouble sharing this with you but i spoke to a doctor i've been talking to them for you know six months i am in a different place right now and i want you to know that you know i'm good and in the past, when you thought I was, I might not have been as good as you thought. Like, there's, you know, a lot of ways to traverse this. But listen, not on this level, but I've been married a really long time. And what I can tell you is that not saying something never ends well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. And from, like, my diabetes standpoint, he takes better care of me then I take care of myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, cause he understands that. Yes. And he, like he wants to go to my doctor's appointments with me and understand as much as he can. And I mean, there are more times than I can count when I've been passed out from drinking or whatever and he changes my pump, knows how, like, gives me a shot because, or whatever. So then aren't you describing a person who would be willing to help you with an issue like the one you have? Does that feel different because it's in your, it, it's, it's your brain? Is that why it feels different? Yeah. Yeah, it's not. It's, there's no difference. There really isn't. There's there's no difference between what you're going through and, like I said, a person with a broken leg not being able to run a race or a person who has a pancreas that doesn't work not being able to, you know, make their food go through their system properly. There's there's no different. It's a part of your body that's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's creating a deficit that needs attention. And when you give it that attention, look what happens. Look what happened to your A1C when you gave your diabetes that attention. You know what I mean? Like, like, I think you just need to do that for this. I mean, he sounds like a really decent guy, you know, I'd hate to see you hide something from him for so long that he felt like he was being kept in the dark. Like, I think it sounds like he wants to be in this with you. That's hard to find. You should lean into that if you can. I am trying. I know you are. I think you're doing a really good job, by the way. You also have to give yourself credit for reaching out to anybody. You really did reach out to me. Like, that's a thing you did. And it worked out great for you. Well, since we have talked, every, well, my life is full of just me thinking, or like lately, just yeah. me thinking. And I don't know, several times a day, I'd be like, just think to myself, like, this is a mistake. I have nothing to say. I don't know it. Like, just all of these negative things. Yeah. You and should, then I was like, you oh should. my gosh, I just need to cancel it. Uh, you, but do you, are you happy you didn't? In tomorrow, when I think back, I'll be happy that I didn't but right now I'm very like on edge you have to you have to believe that you're being lied to by your brain sometimes and I don't know if that's something that you can cognitively do or not um, but you know the 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 thoughts you're getting are not matching what's happening do you know what I mean like it's you're 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 kind of being lied to by your feelings sometimes and, and it sucks because you, you know, it, they're not coming from, you know, they're not coming from Amazon. You can't just refuse the package. Like it's coming right through and you're, you're feeling it no matter what. And I, I think that what I just said is probably completely unreasonable to expect for you to stop. Um, but I think you, I think you just owe it to yourself to look beyond a guy who does a podcast or a 24 year old girl who's, you know, been struggling with it. Like you don't know you know, you don't have the answer. If you had the answer, you'd actually be a psychiatrist. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> and yeah. so, and if I had the answer, I could be charging you like four hundred dollars an hour to have this conversation. So it's not me either. But the one thing I can be a hundred percent certain about is that your feelings are lying to you, and you need to go talk to somebody who can help you stay clear about that and move you in a better direction when you're not able yeah. to help yourself. I think that's like flat out the only thing that we've really talked about here. It, it, that that's that makes sense to me a hundred percent. And I think you agree with me. Yes. Right. So before your thoughts lie to you, involve another person in your life in this decision and get them to help you find someone so that when you want to stop looking, it doesn't happen. Like that. You know what I mean? Like you gotta, you gotta, you ever, you ever heard like the idea of like, you gotta tell people you're on a diet so you can't like, quit it like you you need to like take this clarity you have right now find a person and it, whether it's your it's your boyfriend or it's somebody else and tell them look i i i want to i want to go take this step i need you to help me get to it because i might i might sabotage myself before i get to this appointment and in the meantime okay. i will hold up my end of the bargain by not ending my own life okay i promise 100% you okay. can you can trust me. <laughs> Definitely not doing that. Um, okay. Yeah. The, I mean, listen. I've got there's too many bathrooms to clean. I got laundry to do. I got to put this podcast up. I sold ads to the end of the year. I have to put the podcast up. I already spent the money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I already sent that money to my son's college, and, and and I and and that's it. Like I think small digestible steps, short goals. Um. You know, lean into this guy who sounds terrific and um, and and let him know. Let him know that there are going to be times where you're going to be clear and there are going to be times where, you know, what you think is depression is going to stop you from, you know, following what you intellectually know to be right and that you need to get past that. I think there's a way for you. I really do. Believe, well, I believe guess- me. If you can't believe time will t- time will tell. See, the one you, right away you were negative there. <laughs> there. And see, and so now being serious, there's nothing lost with just you know hoping for hope's sake right there. But you know, it, I, I, enough has happened to you that you're thinking, oh, it's it's more likely this is going to go wrong than it's going to go right, buddy. You know, you can try to be upbeat if you want, but uh, you know, little kids don't have a place to sleep, and I'm depressed. Um, and you might be right, but that doesn't make me wrong. Yeah. You know? All right, yeah. listen, I got to tell you something. I have never spoken to somebody for 90 minutes before and wanted to tell them that I love them, but I, 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 I feel like I would like to say that to you. I love you. I am sure there are other people in your life who love you a lot more than I do. Um, and, uh, and so I think that I think you got to go find those people. You know what I mean? And and stay around them. Okay. So now you've told somebody else empathetic about your life. So now I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to keep you in my heart too while we're talking. All right. Okay. Okay. I know we're going to stop recording. I want you all to know that I did keep in touch with this young lady and we've been talking now for a couple of months And she's doing much, much better. She'll be back on the show at some point to tell you how, but I think it would be unfair for you to leave here not knowing that she talked to her doctor, is seeing a therapist, has found medication that is helping her. And honestly, when I spoke to her yesterday, I double checked to make sure that it was okay to share this with you. She felt like a completely different person to me. She'll come back on at some point and tell you how that all happened. But for now, I didn't want you to leave without knowing that. I know we've been here for a while, but I appreciate the sponsors. They bring this kind of content. Trust me when I tell you that not every organization and company would put their name on an episode about depression and self-harm. If you're looking for an insulin pump, a glucose monitor, an organization to stand up for, or a new blood glucose meter, You can check out Touched by Type 1 at touchedbytype1.org. It's an organization dedicated 
to helping people living with type 1 to live better, healthier, happier lives. Touchedbytype1.org. And if you'd love to see the data that we see through Arden's Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor, dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Find out what direction and speed your blood sugar is moving. Share your information with a loved one or friend through the cloud. Get back the information about how food's impacting you that will allow you to make a better decision with insulin next time. Those of you who are looking for a new insulin pump or want to start using one today, you just have to check out the Omnipod tubeless insulin pump. Tubeless is the really amazing part, but equally cool is that Omnipod will send you a free, no obligation demo of the Omnipod directly to your door. This way you can try it on, decide for yourself what you think. You don't have to take my word for it or anyone else's. Myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. And if you go to contournextone.com today, you may be eligible for an absolutely free blood glucose meter. The blood glucose meter that Arden uses right now. The blood glucose meter that I find to be more usable, friendly, and accurate than any Arden has ever used in her entire time with type 1 diabetes. You can find these links right here in your podcast player or at juiceboxpodcast.com. When I say links, I mean, of course, to Omnipod, Dexcom, Touch by Type 1, the Contour Next 1 blood glucose meter, as well as the phone number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Self-Harm Crisis Text Line. When the person you heard today on the podcast sent me an email, I didn't know them. I didn't know what I was about to find. All I knew is that she seemed like she needed help. And I did not have the heart to ignore her. And there will be somebody in your life that will help you too. A friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a family member, somebody. And if none of those people are available to you, that's cool. The crisis text line can help. The suicide prevention hotline can help. There is someone out there who not only understands what you're going through, but can show you the path back. It happened for her. I'm sorry I can't use her name, but it happened for her. It can happen for you. You're never as alone as you think you are. Thanks so much to everyone who listens and supports the show, shares it online, and of course to the sponsors for making all this possible, my family for allowing me to do this. I am I'm, I'm very emotional today having listened back to this episode uh, during editing, just reminded myself how far that today's guest has come in such a short amount of time. Halfway into this episode, I thought, I made a mistake. I don't know what I'm doing. I shouldn't be involved in this. But then I realized just she just needs somebody to talk to who can help her get to where she needs to go. And that's all I did. She was just a little lost and needed to find her way back. And she's doing that. It's very exciting. I'm going to go now. I want to remind you all to be kind to each other. Wash your hands and take care.